we're going to get started. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, we do have quorum, so we can conduct lawful business. First on the agenda, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from April 3rd? I move the minutes from April 3rd. Vice Chair Lee moves. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So kind of the rundown today is that um, we are going to uh, go over the division report. Uh, we're going to have public testimony. The and then uh, we will have member discussion and uh, amendments will be offered. So um, first, uh, the chair moves that House File 5198, um, as amended, be re-referred to the Tax Committee. Um, and now the uh, chair moves the amendment coded A24-0294. And now we will have um, House research and house fiscal walk through the bill nonpartisan please proceed mr chair and members jared swanson with house research uh, we're going to start with a uh, section by section walkthrough of the 824-0294 amendment um, in member packets should be a copy of the amendment as well as a house research bill summary uh, we'll be working off the bill summary so beginning with Article 1, which is the property taxes and aids article. Section 1 of Article 1 provides a property tax exemption for five parcels of land owned by the Grand Portage Band. Section 2 of Article 1 provides a property tax exemption for a property in Minneapolis owned by the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Section 3 of Article 1 increases the classification tier thresholds for Class 1C homestead resorts. Sections 4 through 7 of Article 1 allow local units of government to abate property taxes on property that will be used to develop affordable housing and on property that is held by a land bank organization for future development. Included in this provision is the amendment that was adopted in committee that um, has the requirement that an abatement be repaid if the land is ultimately used for a purpose other than the purpose given by the land bank prior to redevelopment. Sections 8 and 9 of Article 1 uh, relate to town aid, and these sections modify the town aid calculation so that the entire appropriation is spent in each, um, each distribution year, and these sections increase the annual appropriation of township aid from 10 million to 11.5 million. Section 10 of Article 1 provides a property tax exemption for property taxes paid in 2022 and a portion of taxes paid in 2021 for a property in Minneapolis purchased by the Red Lake Nation for the Red Lake Nation College. And finally, uh, Section 11 of Article 1 allows the City of Stewart to receive a portion of its 2023 local government aid payment that was withheld. The city would receive this withheld aid amount provided that by June 1, the state auditor certifies that the city has submitted its required financial statements for 2022. And Mr. Chair, that concludes Article 1. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Hicks. Oh, please continue, Mr. Swanson. Uh, moving on to Article 2. Uh, article 2 is the minerals article. Uh, section 1 of Article 2 increases the maximum Taconite Homestead property tax credit to $515. Sections 2 and 3 of Article 2 change how fiscal disparities is shown on both the proposed property tax statement and the regular property tax statement for commercial and industrial property within the boundaries of the Iron Range Fiscal Disparities Program. Under these sections, the amount of tax shown for each jurisdiction would be equal to the jurisdiction's tax rate times the net tax capacity of the property. An additional line would be added to the statement uh, labeled as the fiscal disparities adjustment, and this would be equal to the um, actual amount of tax that is paid by the property minus the sum of the amounts shown on the statement for each jurisdiction. Now, for some properties, um, this, depending on where they're located, this adjustment will be positive, and for others, it will be negative. Section 4 of Article 2 clarifies that the redirection of 10% of the gross proceeds tax to Aurora, Babbitt, Ely, Hoyt Lakes, Bowabic, and Embarrassed Township for the first five years that distributions of the gross proceeds tax are made only applies to distributions of taxes paid by a mining operation that's located within the Taconite Assistance Area as it was defined prior to the changes to that definition that were enacted in the 2023 tax bill. 
Section 5 of Article 2 increases the taconite production tax distribution to the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools from 0 0.3 cents per taxable ton up to 0 0.4 cents per taxable ton. <coughs> Section 6 of Article 2 increases the annual transfer from the taconite production tax distribution from the Douglas J. Johnson Economic Protection Trust Fund to the Iron Range Consolidation and Cooperatively Operated School Account. Both of these are production tax distribution accounts. Under current law, $3.5 million is annually transferred between these two accounts. What this section would do is increase these annual transfers uh, between 2024 and 2036. And the transfers change depending on the range of years and the, um, those different amounts are in uh, the bill summary in uh, section six. Section 7 of Article 2 increases from 15,000 to 25,000 the amount of the taconite production tax distribution to the taconite municipal aid account that is annually distributed to Brighting Township. Section 8 of Article 2 relates to the bonding sections that are in sections 9, section, section 9 and section 10. And this section clarifies that the Douglas J. Johnson Economic Protection Trust Fund may be used to fund reserve accounts to secure payments of those bonds that are authorized in each of those sections. Section 9 of Article 2 requires the Commissioner of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation to issue up to $49 million in bonds in 2024 to fund grants for a variety of projects. The bond payments would be made from the taconite production tax distribution to the Iron Range Consolidation and Cooperatively Operated School Account. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to list out all the projects, but members can find um, those in subdivision three of Article 9, and that begins on page 16 of the DE amendment. Uh, moving on to section 10 of Article 2, this section requires the Commissioner of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation to issue up to $30.5 million in bonds in 2025 to fund grants for a variety of projects. Uh, again, like Section 9, the bond payments would be made from the taconite production tax distributions to the Iron Range Consolidation and Cooperatively Operated School Account. Um, and again, those um, projects are all listed in Subdivision 3 of this section. Uh, members can find that on page 21 of the DE amendment. And lastly, Section 11 of Article 2 uh, provides a one-time transfer of $3 million from the 2024 oh. distribution of the tax of the Taconite Production Tax to the Taconite Economic Development Fund to the City of Chisholm for the Dave, Senator David Tomasoni Bridge of Peace. And Mr. Chair, that concludes Article 2. Thank you. Ms. Hagler. Um, Mr. Chair and members, Alex Hagler with House Research. Um, I'll be covering Articles 3 and 4. Article 3 um, is the tax increment financing article um, and it contains provisions for the cities of Ramsey, Maple Grove, St. Paul, Brooklyn Center, Eden Prairie, Edina, Minnetonka, Moorhead, Plymouth, and St. Cloud. Um, each of these provisions are in the division report as they were heard in committee um, with the exception of one change to the Eden Prairie provision. Um, for the division report, the expiration of the authorization to um, establish districts was modified um, from the end of 2031 to end of 2025. Um, Mr. Chair, that was the summary of the TIF article. If you want me to go into greater detail? No. Okay. Um, moving on to Article 4, um, the special local taxes article. Um, the first two sections come from House File 3414, the Accommodations Interme <coughs> Intermediaries Lodging Tax Bill that was heard in provision. Um, these provisions are um, largely the same as they were heard in division, just with minor um, technical wording changes. Sections three and four relate to the Food and Beverage and Lodging Tax um, Bill, House File 3715. Um, about the um, Minneapolis downtown taxing district. Uh, these provisions are also the same as were heard in division and include the modification to the effective date um, as was adopted by the A1 amendment in, in division. And um, Mr. Chair, that concludes Article 4. Um, Mr. Swanson will close out the walkthrough. Please continue. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Jared Swanson with House Research. Um, moving on to Article 5, which is the miscellaneous article. Uh, sections 1 through 5 of Article 5 
uh, contain House File 1342, uh, which is the uh, Land Value Taxation District bill that was heard in uh, committee recently. These sections would allow cities to establish land value taxation districts and reallocate property taxes within those districts on the basis of an alternative tax base, including reallocation solely based on the land value of properties within the district. Um, because this was uh, just recently heard in committee, I'm not going to do a detailed walkthrough of each of these five sections, but I'd be happy to provide more detail on any of them if members have questions. And then um, finally, Section 6 of Article 5 uh, provides a grant of $100,000 in fiscal year 2024 to the City of South St. Paul for planning and development costs within the city. Mr. Chair, that concludes Article 5, the miscellaneous article and a walkthrough of the division report. Thank you so much. Um, before we move on uh, to House Fiscal, any questions at this point? No? Okay. We could uh, turn it over to... Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Katrina Highmark, House Fiscal. Um, I'll be giving an overview of the general fund and non-general fund position, provisions, excuse me, um, in the um, House File 5198 as amended um, that my colleagues have um, discussed. First, on your spreadsheet, you'll see the creation of the land value taxation districts, which is the last provision that my colleague, Mr. Swanson, discussed. This has an unknown positive and an unknown negative impact. It's a true unknown in fiscal 26 um, and 27, uh, according to the revenue estimate from the Department of Revenue. The property tax abatement for land bank property has a cost of um, $10,000 in fiscal 26 and fiscal 27. The property tax exemption for the Red Lake Nation Tribal College in Minneapolis has a cost of $122,000 in fiscal year 24. The exemption for the Grand Portage Band um, has a zero cost for the provision, but there are interactions. Um, these interactions of a negligible positive impact on the school building bond credit and a negligible negative impact on the property tax refund. Um, next is the Homestead Resort property tax modifications, which will um, begin to take effect in assessment year 2025 and will therefore have a negative impact of $30,000 in fiscal year 27. The property tax exemption for the Leech Lake Band property in Minneapolis is also effective assessment year 2025, which results in a fiscal cost of $10,000 in fiscal year 2027. Moving on to property tax credits, we have the Tech Night Homestead Credit Adjustment which increases the maximum um, credit to $515. That's effective in pay 2025 and has a fiscal impact um, beginning in um, fiscal 26 and 27 of $1.7 million um, in terms of the property tax refund interaction and $80,000 in terms of income tax interaction, which results in a total of $1.78 million in the tails. In terms of local aims, LGA Township Aid Calculation Adjustment, as was heard in um, Division, is effective in pay 2025 and has a total cost in the tails of uh, $4.82 uh, million, given the interactions, um, both with property tax refunds and income tax. Penalty forgiveness for the city of Stewart because it is taking place um, within this fiscal year. There is no um, fiscal cost to that provision of the bill. And in terms of general, ta um, general fund expenditures, the one-time grant to South St. Paul is $100,000 in fiscal year 24. And that concludes the um, general fund expenditures. I'll do a high level overview of the non-general fund change items. We have um, additional funds being used to pay the TAC Knight Homestead Credit Adjustment out of the TAC Knight Property Tax Relief Fund. Next on your spreadsheets, you can see um, the way in which the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools account receives that distribution increase um, through transfers from the TAC Knight Environmental Protection Fund and the Douglas J. Johnson Economic Protection Fund. The Iron Range School 
excuse me, Iron Range School Consolidation Account on line 42 has a distribution increase um, that is funded through transfers from the Douglas J. Johnson Fund. And um, those um, bonds that my colleague, Mr. Swanson, discussed are also funded through the Iron Range School Consolidation Account. And finally, um, the funds for the Senator David Tomasoni Bridge of Peace come from the Taconite Economic Development Fund. And that includes, concludes the walkthrough, Mr. Chair. Thank you, very nice. Um, any discussion from members before we move to uh, public testimony? Okay, um, seeing none, um, first we have um, St. Louis County Commissioner <coughs> Paul McDonald. Welcome, uh, state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony, my friend. Thank you, Chair Liz Lagarde and members. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here this morning and talk a little bit and give a thank you to the chair and the committee for the support of the proposed changes uh, to help with the Taconite Homestead Credit. I mean, if you do any history on this, 1977 started, hasn't been touched again since 1998. So this increase will affect each and every homeowner on the Iron Range. And it's been a long time coming, but we we have it uh, at, in our grasp. And I just want to uh, let you know on behalf of the St. Louis County Board of Commissioners, we join with our legislators and urge the legislature to pass this meaningful and long overdue legislation for property tax relief. It's good for our homeowners. It's good for our local taxing districts. We have some of those people with us today. And it means that much of the pressure on tax levies will now be reduced, thus lowering future property tax increases. And uh, we urge this group and the legislature to pass this desperately needed property tax relief now. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your work. Continue to do good things. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Nathan Jessen, League of Minnesota Cities. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Nathan Jessen. I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify on the Property Tax Division report. Uh, also included in your packets is a letter I provided with additional background on the local lodging tax provision, which I'll mainly be speaking to. That's in Article 4, Sections 1 and 2. Uh, the main issue those sections would address is a current disparity between what local lodging tax revenue is subject to taxation, depending on how the tax is administered for these accommodation intermediaries. So under current law, if you book a room in a city with a local lodging tax by calling the hotel or going straight directly to the hotel website and you spend $100 on that room, you pay a, a local lodging tax on all of that $100. But if you book a room at the same hotel in the same location, using uh, an online travel company website, you only pay lodging tax on the portion of the purchase that the hotel retains. So if an online travel company keeps 10 or $15 of that $100, uh, that's not being taxed for these locally administered lodging taxes. Um, and that's the vast majority of most local lodging taxes. They're predominantly located in greater Minnesota. Uh, but if it is a, lodging, a local lodging tax that's being administered by the state, uh, it, that uh, 10 or $15 is taxable. So there's kind of this disparity here. And that's the case in cities like St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Rochester. Uh, some questions have come up whether or not this proposal can be administered. Uh, I would just point to the fact that these online uh, travel companies and accommodation intermediaries are paying sales tax. There's a lot of different sales tax rates across the state. Uh, also included in your uh, packets is a handout and letter from Hospitality Minnesota uh, in favor of the bill. Uh, one other provision that the League of Minnesota Cities wanted to speak to is just the uh, local government aid penalty for forgiveness for the city of Stewart. Uh, that was a case of Stewart just being in between city clerks when they're uh, trying to comply with the OSA requirements 
and they're, they're now caught up with uh, those reporting requirements. So thank you for the time to testify, and I'll be around if any questions come up. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have uh, Joel Carlson. Welcome. State your name for the record, and please proceed with your testimony. Well, <clears throat> good morning, Mr. Chair. I'm Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul. And uh, I have two things I want to briefly talk to you about. There's two tourism-related issues in the bill. Uh, the first, and I want to thank the committee for including the resort property tax um, um, tier adjustments in the bill. Um, the second one, maybe not so much. Um, <laughs> I represent uh, Expedia. Uh, and we have long had disagreement about uh, this intermediary local lodging tax. And I can tell you that although everyone talks about online travel, that is not what this does. Everyone, everyone who books travel, a travel agent, a tour group that's bringing someone from Europe to go to the Mall of America, everyone who arrange, arranges lodging is a travel intermediary. And there are hundreds of hardline travel agents and tour groups, and there are a few online travel companies. So this applies to everyone. You need to look at the defini definition of the statute. It applies to everyone. It's not an online travel tax. As it relates to the online companies, it is true uh, that travel agents and online companies pay sales tax to the state of Minnesota. That is collected by the state, and we remit that. But the legislature has never amended local lodging taxes, ever. And while some may think that online, uh, that online and hardline uh, travel agents pay that local lodging tax, that is just not uniform, and I don't believe that that is the case. And it's certainly not my position. S Mr. Chair, members, Think about this. You're talking about, let's say a travel agent books um, $10,000 of room nights in a local community. Um, and let's use Mr. Jessen's number at 10% that the, that the travel agent, the realtor, the leasing agent keeps the 10%. That's $1,000. The remittance for this is $30. The cost to comply with that $30 for all your bookings doesn't justify being in that business. This is a free marketing opportunity for lodging properties across the state when they are on a website or a agent is booking for them. And to impose this tax, which we've never done and we've resisted it for years, is unfair, it is impossible, and if you, to, Quick things, Mr. Chairman. If you look at the language of the bill, it doesn't just apply to uh, travel intermediaries. It applies to ancillary and related services, such as services provided by an accommodation intermediary. What else is ancillary to the lodging? Is it the cleaning service? Is it the, is it the lawn service? What, it just applies to things like us, but what else? And you also need to know that allowing the local unit of government to be in the selective enforcement of sending the zip codes to a company they want to find but not to another really runs afoul of our constitutional requirements of equal taxation for everyone doing the same thing. Happy to answer questions, Mr. Chairman. We're strongly opposed to this, continue to be strongly opposed to this, politely, but we're very opposed to this. I like happy, politely. Happy to answer questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Anyone else in the audience? Oh, 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 anyone else in the audience? Okay, we will move to member discussion. Um, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carlson, could you please come back for a second to the table and uh, clear up something, at least uh, <clears throat> for my confusion? We're being told that states already collect this, this uh, tax but local units of government are not collecting it. So explain that to us and why the discrepancy and why is it okay for one and not the other? Mr. Carlson. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Anderson, 
the legislature has never amended local lodging taxes. That is just the facts. They have never amended local lodging taxes to allow travel intermediaries to pay local lodging taxes. There is a suggestion that some are paying that, and I don't have insight into every travel intermediary and what they may be paying. But I can tell you that the legislature has never amended local lodging tax to apply to these services. What the legislature did in 2011 is they created two new categories, a accommodation intermediary, someone that's arranging the travel, and an accommodation provider. They put a sales tax on a accommodation intermediary if they were charging for the room. Many of these situations, and you've done it yourself, many of these situations, the accommodation intermediary doesn't collect the money. You pay when you go to the hotel. It is only, and in, and in that instance, they pay 100%. Uh, there's no avoidance of the local lodging tax. 100% of the room charge that a hotelier or a resort charges that's subject to local lodging tax <coughs> is remitted by the accommodation provider. And that's who that tax is applied to. It is never applied to accommodation intermediaries. Representative Anderson. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Okay. Well, well this is getting this is pretty nice here. <laughs> thank you. All right. So um, next, we are going to uh, move to um, amendments. And so. First, we have a <coughs> amendment um, from Representative Quam. It is um, House File 98A2. Um, to your amendment, Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I understand the intent when we heard this um, in committee, but frankly, without uh, constraints and um, language in there to prevent it. I'm concerned that this would allow for discrimination, uh, retribution, and influence peddling um, with with certain entities within, you know, a district. No, we didn't. Um, I, I'm not seeing enough. Uh, comfort language to show that there'd be a prevention. Okay, so um, are you going to move, would you like to move your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I would move the A2 amendment. Okay, so Representative Kwong moves um, his A2 amendment. Um, further discussion? Mr. Chair. Representative Nelson. Um, just so we're doing things properly, we never voted to, on the A1 amendment, the DE amendment, we never voted on that. You, you brought it up, but we, you made the motion to, when then we heard it, but we never voted to adopt the A1 amendment. So before we can do the A2, we have to adopt the A1. Mr. Chair, I withdraw my amendment until it's Thank in you. time. I appreciate that. Um, so I will move uh, the A1. Um, any discussion? Excuse me. Yeah. We got the smart people coming up to take a look now. <laughs> okay, so um, after further, um, we do not have to adopt that. That'll be done at the okay. end. But I didn't know, so that was a great question. I we smart. got it clarified. If we were, if we all knew everything, we wouldn't be sitting here at this table. All right, to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the interpretation is that you brought forward your amendment, and we can do amendments to the amendment yep. before voting on the amendment. Thank you for that clarification, yep. and I will renew my A2 amendment to the amendment. Okay. So, uh, any discussion? On the A2. <clears throat> Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when this provision was um, discussed in committee, I was um, 
a little concerned about what could be down the street and, and the cross traffic on a few intersections down the road on this. Um, again, um, this is the provision that would allow existing property to be evaluated um, by a community um, if it's not to a use that the community might be interested in and they could adopt. Um, and I think it was um, Chair Gomez who said that there's a, uh, the word she uses, a bombed out hotel in her neighborhood or in her district. and that she tried to broker a deal on the sale of that property, but the owner having property, uh, private property rights said, not today, I'm not interested in selling. But this bill would allow a local unit of government and any of those that would be on the tax, um, local, local property taxes, to be able to um, um, impute a value and collect taxes as if it were improved to the level that the community uh, or the city or whomever de deemed was an appropriate level on that. So I talk about um, cross traffic at the intersections on this. I am very concerned about local government spending money in tax court um, uh, on this particular provision. Um, a property owner does not have to, um, and I think constitutionally we're going to see some issues. This is considered a taking. We have had some Supreme Court rulings on this, and I think that this will ultimately end up at the Supreme Court again um, as a test case, not only here in the state of Minnesota, but under federal law as well. Um, and here are, the, here are the problems that we have. Number one, we know that property values in Hennepin and Ramsey County um, currently um, are experiencing, particularly commercial properties, are experiencing a decline in value because of rents. And that's how you, you determine the value of commercial property. Um, is through the income it generates and you convert that net income mm -hmm. into a value on the property. So the concern that I have is if we impute an artificial value on a property that isn't improved or we really actually don't have market conditions that we open ourselves up to litigation and that litigation costs money and if the uh, property owner prevails for just simply owning the property but not using it in a way that a local municipality may deem is, is appropriate or, or um, quote unquote necessary in the community that we, we um, are asking for lots and lots of different issues and problems um, coming forward. And so I like the Quam Amendment um, for, for that reason. And then the flip side of this is, so what happens if we do a, an evaluation in this time of falling rents where we want to use that property and we find out that the current value of the property yeah. is in fact a higher property that generates more income or revenues for the local units of government. Are we going to impute that value or are we going to default back to the higher of the two, the current value as it's used and the, the uh, prospective pro forma, I should say not prospective, but pro forma value of that real estate. And I'm very concerned that this could um, end up setting a, a fairly bad precedent for us. And so, Mr. Chair, um, I uh, support the Quam A2 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Chair Gomez. Um, I'll just keep it brief. want to just say I'm not a constitutional scholar, nor is Representative O'Driscoll. This has been the law in, um, I believe it's Pennsylvania. They've used it in, in Michigan for many, many years. It has not presented a constitutional challenge. This is actually much more of kind of a, of a narrow and constrained policy than they have in those places. So, you know, uh, we can sort of sit here and muse about things like that, but it's actually been tested elsewhere, hasn't gone to the Supreme Court, hasn't gotten anywhere near. So just wanted to note that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll observe as well that already right now, uh, assessors are required to separately assess the value of the land and the structure. Uh, and um, so if there's a, a vacant property, they're essentially assessing the, the property on the basis of the, the land alone already. Uh, so, you know, in, in creating the assessments, it's, it's just something that they're already required to do. Any further discussion? Representative Kwong. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Thank Mr. Mr. Chair. Not being familiar with the committee and floor debate of the referenced uh, legislation which became law in other states. Uh, generally, when the um, judicial branch is trying to determine um, in a case, they look at legislative intent. Mm -hmm. And in and during our discussion of this language, 
when it was in the bill to be laid over for possible inclusion, uh, it was there was discussion that included the positive utilization of coercion upon a property owner. Um, and frankly, with that, um, that bothers me that we don't have uh, language included in the bill to clarify that we wouldn't want local governments to use this as a hammer to force a property owner to uh, use or convert that or, you know, make them do exactly what. I thought the United States was, and Minnesota were a land of, of uh, you know, freedoms. And I, I think we really need a little bit better control in language in this in this portion of the bill. So until we actually do that, I would uh, ask support for this amendment, and I will I'll ask for a roll call on it. Roll call being requested. A roll call will be granted. Any further discussion? Seeing none. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Liz Lagarde? No. Liz Lagarde, no. Vice Chair Lee? No. Mm. Lee, no. Uh, Republican lead Quam? Yes. Quam, yes. Representative Anderson? Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Representative Burkle? Burkle, I. Burkle, I. Representative Coulter? No. Coulter, no. Representative Elkins? Elkins, no. Elkins, no. Representative Garofalo? Excused. Representative Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Representative Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Representative Hewitt. No. Hewitt, no. Representative Nelson. No. Nelson, no. Representative O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, I. O'Driscoll, I. There is. Four eyes, eight no's, one excused. It does not prevail. Okay, next we have um, House File 4044, um, Representative Anderson. Um, would you like to move your amendment? Another amendment. Mr. Chair, yes, I'd like to move uh, what uh, is called House File 4044 before the Property Tax Division. Okay, it has been moved. Uh, discussion to your uh, amendment. Thanks again, Mr. Chair. By way of some explanation, I'm bringing this uh, forward on behalf of Representative Jacob, who has worked extremely hard on this, this, uh, this topic. And if you look at the top of the bill, uh, it lists five authors, but it really has had 23 co-authors, including the vice chair of the Ag Committee, Representative Purcell, it's also supported by Ag Commissioner Tom Peterson. And the reason for the initiative is because of the, the uh, nitrate in the water situation in southeast Minnesota. This is an attempt to, to um, incentivize farmers in the area to uh, adopt the solid conservation practices. And uh, this bill would uh, allow a a mon monetary credit of $5 an acre for each acre enrolled in what's called the water quality certification program. And a little background on that program, uh, it was begun here in Minnesota, it's kind of a unique program. And what it does is a farmer uh, voluntarily, this is a voluntary program, uh, would contact his local SWCD office and sets up an appointment. At my farm also was water quality certified. So somebody would come out to our farm and they would really go over two main re things, your, your uh, your tillage practices, whether you're reduced tillage or if you are applying your fertilizer in a precision application form. Those are the two main main areas. And uh, those are two of the big reasons why we could have uh, nutrients like uh, nitrogen leach off the soil, get into our groundwater or surface water and cause some issues as they are doing in southeast Minnesota with high nitrate levels and a lot of drinking water wells in southeast Minnesota. 
So what this program does, it does have a cost, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's estimated in the, in the eight counties that this would target the eight counties of southeast Minnesota. They are Dodge, Fillmore, Goodhue, Houston, Mauer, Olmstead, Wabasha, and Winona, and then some select townships in Dakota County and in Rice County that are part of this uh, southeast Minnesota karst region. Karst is the type of soil down there that allows uh, very rapid leaching of, of nitrates and such through the, the soil profile. And um, so anybody who is, a, who is certified and belongs to this water quality certification program in there, they are um, certified by the county auditor and by the SWCD. They would be eligible for a $5 per acre credit as kind of an incentive for joining the program and as a, as a kind of a carrot to improve conservation practices and in that way work at reducing the nitrate uh, losses in, in areas of southeast Minnesota. Again, Mr. Mr. Chairman, it was a well thought out plan by Representative Jacob, who was on the Ag Committee. We heard this bill in the Ag Committee and had a lot of support, but the issue became one of this not being a, a budget year. And um, the cost would be under a million dollars a year. It's estimated there are about uh, 200,000 acres that are, that are eligible um, in, the, in this affected area. But it's a, it's a solid program. It would aim at uh, helping the nitrate issue in southeast Minnesota. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would stand for questions, but uh, would urge members to support, support the bill. Thank you. Um, member discussion or questions? Seeing none, um, I'll just make a, um, a comment. Uh, Representative Anderson, uh, that was a very well thought out, um, and I know that you are uh, an advocate and you uh, work very hard. Um, there is, I'll be right there. Um, there is a, um, a cost to this in the tails, as you know. Um, Representative Jacobson came to me, um, and I do know that it went through a committee, yeah. so uh, it was laid out really, really well. But uh, with the tails, um, it makes it more difficult. I'll just say that. Lee Kwong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I grew up in this area on a farm, and we had a shallow well. And when I was a kid, I remember there were some issues and we had to go to a deeper well. Um, I'm not sure if those, the contamination is the reason for my poor sense of humor, but uh, um, I, 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 I am aware of the issues that we have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you started slow, but you're coming on strong there, fella. <laughs> <laughs> um, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. That would be a strong argument to pass this. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I, I appreciate the chair's indulgence and the committee for listening to this. It is a problem. We are trying to, to uh, work on it and improve the situation there for the folks who have these situations. We all want folks to have clean drinking water. Yeah. But I, I appreciate the situation, but I would ask for a roll call vote, Mr. Chair. A roll call um, being requested. A roll call will be granted. Um, the clerk will take the... Chair Lizgard? No. Lizgard, no. Vice Chair Lee? Nay. Lee, nay. Republican lead, Quam? Yes. Quam, yes. Representative Anderson? Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Representative Burkle? Burkle, I. Burkle, I. Representative Coulter? No. Coulter, no. Representative Elkins? Elkins, no. Elkins, no. Representative Gomez? Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Representative Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Representative Hewitt. No. Hewitt, no. Representative Nelson. No. Nelson, no. Representative O'Driscoll. Excuse. Okay, so we have three ayes, eight noes, and two excused. Um, the amendment does not prevail. Um, <laughs> We have the A3. Um, would you like to move your A3, Representative Kwong? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the A3 uh, amendment. And the intent of this is the most frequent reason people contact about property taxes is they've had a big bump in the valuation. And 
We also address that by having, if it's a really big bump, there's a sort of convoluted process to get a partial property tax refund. Uh, my thought is to prevent this from happening by capping an increase of valuation at, at 10 percent. Um, it does have an exemption to this in that if a property is sold, transferred, <coughs> or otherwise disposed of, its value would go to what the sale or transfer price was uh, and would not be limited by this because the new owner yeah. knows that the market value is what he paid for it or her, she paid for it, and that way it automatically goes to that point. Um, with this, you would not only prevent the situation, but you could uh, no longer need that convoluted process, the people, the expense, and et cetera, of uh, trying to or addressing the high increase. And so it, it, it's twofold. One, uh, make people feel less aggravated, because uh, they tend to be a little uh, c concerned when this hits. Um, next, it, it would actually save on the budget by not having the overhead because excess, you know, property taxes are, that those dollars are partially going back, but you've got the people. So I, I think uh, revenue-wise, it'd be fairly neutral, but on the uh, temperament of how they feel towards government, I think this will make people uh, happier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any um, discussion? Representative Anderson. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I like the idea of this because we all get phone calls from constituents and they say, my taxes are doubling, for example. And then you say, well, let's look at, the, at your uh, statement and a lot of times it's evaluation, that they, they get confused by valuation in the actual, actual tax bill. So I like the idea of this, and, and I would go so far as to say this would be completely revenue neutral because if the valuation increase is capped at 10 percent, they would probably have to increase the levy to get the, it all boils down to the dollars you need to collect, and either it's through a higher levy or a, a mill increase or the, the valuation. So. Um, I would support this amendment. It, uh, it would kind of bring some semblance of sanity back into what's happened to valuations. Um, I just talked to a lady that because of a, a school bond increase, a referendum, and uh, being brought up to what the, the ratios were supposed to be, their, their taxes, in fact, doubled on a very modest home back out in, in rural Minnesota. So I think this would... would um, kind of give folks some stability in terms of not seeing their valuations go up more than 10% in a year. But again, the, the mill rate would, would probably be increased and I think it would be revenue neutral. So I would support the amendment, the Quam amendment here, Mr. Chair. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, um, you know, I do see it. The evaluations have uh, gone up for multiple um, reasons, you know, in, in with the, the price that people are paying um, for properties across in a, in a certain geographical area. So um, while I see some of your points, um, I'm going to respectfully just uh, ask for a no vote on this. Um, you know, this amendment looks like it would cap evaluation increases even in the event of new additions and stuff like that. And so there are just some things in here that um, that I that I have concern moving forward at this time, so um, definitely next year uh, to take a, a look at it. So, um, any further discussion? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and if the increase ends up coming from a rate, you know, mill rate adjustment, uh, local government is very tied into the local economy, and so there's. Uh, I think a pretty good feedback, and uh, you know, if if this isn't added here, we we may revisit this on the the House floor because yeah. of that. And 
because of that, I, I won't be asking for, you know, the roll. We can do that on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Um, no roll call, but uh, all those in favor, uh, sing by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Uh, it does not prevail. Okay, next um, we have the A5. Representative Kwan, would you like to move your A5 amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the A5 amendment. And I enjoy the committee discussion. And there have been multiple times where members of the committee, both sides of the aisle, have had some concerns about uh, variances uh, on TIF for communities that have uh, rather robust uh, property tax. You know, they're a richer city, and uh, there's already, you know, a process for TIF, but the exceptions, I think, we should look at that and maybe limit some of these exceptions for the well-to-do cities. So this sets up a, uh, if your city per capita, so per person, is 150% of the tax, property tax capital per person average in the state, you're, you know, again, 50% greater in that tax capacity for the same mill rate. Um, I think that we should have a, uh, you know, sort of a pause in exceptions for the, for those well-to-do cities. Um, they can still do normal TIF, but get, you know, going the exception route. I think we need to have some parameters because our committee, I don't begrudge the time we give to all of these TIF exceptions, but there are several that are so common that we should actually implement in statute appropriate processes so that you know they don't have to drive hours to get here and to get an automatic yes from us because it's a normal exception and that then we can in that process make sure that if we want to uh, target or limit that to communities that have poor tax capacity or um, if it has to do with affordable housing in other categories, there would be an automatic process just so that it's more responsive. You know, we haven't been made a full-time uh, legislature, so it's more responsive to the communities and it takes out that extra bureaucratic effect of, you know, coming and testifying here for something that, uh, for the most part, it is pencil whipped through. So this, this is meant, you know, similar to some of the proposals where they've wanted a, a sales tax moratorium and some of the other taxes. I, I think this would uh, be good for the local communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any uh, discussion? Anyone? I will just, uh, I would just make a comment. I would, I would think that there are some um, colleagues that, you know, we've had them discussions and, and, and they would like to probably continue them. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from the range and, and I view things a little, a little differently. Um, you know, the success of some of these, um, these communities, they really enhance so many other people's lives across the state of Minnesota. And um, some of them projects are, um, take time they take and you need to be adjusted. Uh, and so uh, it's a but for to get some of these big developments, which in turn helps um, some of those communities in greater Minnesota that it's very difficult to bring wealth, bring opportunity to. And so um, I, for them, that reason, knowing full well that we've had many of them discussions and some probably feel like that, um, I'm gonna ask, uh, respectfully just ask no. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And because of the high iron content in the uh, the water up there, I think you've got less uh, phosphate nitrate issues than we don't do in my. Um, so come on down. I'll yeah. offer you local water, and yeah. we can talk it over. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
Um, so, all those in favor of the A5, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. <laughs> Motion um, does not prevail. Okay, are there any further amendments <clears throat> to come before the body? Anyone? Okay. Finally, uh, we will adopt um, uh, the DE, so Chair Listengard moves. Uh, the DE amendment, coded A24-0294. Uh, any discussion? Any discussion? Representative Kwong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wish that we had been able to add you know, additional uh, comfort language to avoid some of the concerns <laughs> that we, you know, many of us have had in different portions. Um, and I look forward to, uh, you know, probably not more than 10 or 12 hours debate on the House floor. <laughs> but uh, <You're> joke. Th <laughs> thank, thank you for, uh, uh, you know, cross your fingers and maybe it's less, but thank you for the, uh, uh, you know, this, you know, committee's interactions. Uh, sometimes it's been very energetic um, and passionate, but there's oftentimes been commonality uh, in our concerns. So thank you, and we'll see how the vote goes. I think we can guess. Okay, um, well, we will take it. Any further discussion? I have one. I know okay. I'm not supposed to speak after the lead, though. <laughs> Go ahead. So I just want to thank the chair. Uh, on page 19, 8 and 9, you identified something in your region that was really important that I've been working on for the last two years that you've been a part of is the uh, grant uh, in there for 150 k for emergency preparedness training for high school. Um, highly needed in your area. This hopefully will help us with EMTs. It will help us with police officers and firefighters. We, we really need it in your area, and I appreciate you putting it in your bill. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All those in favor, single by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. No. No. All right. Motion prevails. Um, and so for our uh, closing, um, I would just, uh, I'd just like to thank um, this committee. Um, it truly really has um, been an honor for me to uh, oversee this committee um, the last uh, two years. And uh, I've learned so much, and I've grown so much, and I've built relationships. I, uh, I see things differently um, through, the, through the conversations and through the relationships um, because I listen to other people, and I listen um, through their lens. Um, and so it's truly been an honor for, for me, and uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Lee, thank you so much for um, always being there. And uh, Majority um, Lee Kwam, um, yes, you brought some big vigor and vitality, a little bit of humor, um, and uh, you brought, you know, good discussion to the committee, and I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Anderson, you are one of the most thoughtful um, individuals uh, in that this body has, and I truly appreciate that um, and what you, you bring to that. And then also for all of the staff, um, I could go right down the list, and I am going to because you never know. Carl, thank you so much for keeping me on task. Um, you know, without you, I'd probably still be stuck in an elevator. Um, <laughs> you know, <Pretty> arranged. <laughs> <laughs> probably could be. Um, to um, Patrick, um, Patrick is one of them individuals that um, was tasked with um, um, being the CA for Chair Gomez and and for myself. And uh, um, there's only a wall separating our two offices. And. Uh, he, you know, to watch you do your job. It's truly incredible, and we're blessed to have you as well. Um, Sean Haydorn, thank you so much for putting them together to give um, the foundation and the understanding of what we are looking at. Um, Sam, uh, welcome. Uh, you know, you did a nice job uh, coming in. Your demeanor, your thoughtfulness checking in was, was very much appreciated. Uh, Commissioner uh, Marquardt and Joanna, thank you guys so much for always being here. Um, you know, your professionalism, your, your kindness. Um, chair um, Marquardt, or Commissioner Marquardt, who was a chair, uh, I was fortunate enough for four years to be vice chair underneath him, 
and his demeanor and how he treated people with respect, dignity, um, and he was open and fair, pragmatic. Um, I think that you guys bring that when you come up and you testify uh, before us, and I think that's extremely important. House Research, Jared, um, Sean, Chris, um, Alex, and uh, Katrina from Fisco and Cynthia. Um, seriously, <laughs> they are um, the foundation and the bedrock of, of, of this institution. <clears throat> um, Nonpartisan comes in with a um, unbiased view of whatever we're trying to do, and they give us good counsel, and they help shape it so when we, when, when we try to make it into law, it's, it's coherent, to be honest with you, right? Because um, there's so much that we don't understand. Um, and so I want to thank each and every one of you for your professionalism, your, your understanding of our limited understanding of some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, the, the amount of patience in your work ethic is truly, truly incredible. The reviser's office, um, I met one in the elevator today, uh, and I says, you probably know who I am. He just smiled. <laughs> uh, you know? So um, Evan and um, you know, Sandy, thank you guys so much um, for all of that. So simply put, um, this has been um, an incredible opportunity for me where I've grown as a person and uh, as, a, as a legislator and a policymaker. So um, thank you all, truly. So with that, um, I renew uh, my motion that House File 5198, as amended, be re-referred to the Tax Committee and that staff make any technical uh, adjustments necessary to the bill language and the spreadsheet to reflect the intent of this Property Tax Division report. All those in favor? Is anybody saying aye? We are aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. Uh, we, it is amended and it is referred to the tax committee and we are adjourned. Thank you.